Bleak House by Charles Dickens Audiobook 10x65 He brings actions for trespass, I bring actions for trespass. He brings actions, actions for assault and battery, I defend them and continue to assault and batter. Ha, ha, ha. To hear him say all this with unimaginable energy, one might have thought him the angriest of mankind. To see him at the very same time, looking at the bird now perched upon his thumb and softly smoothing its feathers with his forefinger, one might have thought him the gentlest. To hear him laugh and see the broad good nature of his face then, one might have supposed that he had not a care in the world, or a dispute, or a dislike, but that his whole existence was a summer joke. No, no, he said, no closing up of my paths by any did lock. Though I willingly confess, here he softened in a moment, that Lady Didlock is the most accomplished lady in the world, to whom I would do any homage that a plain gentleman, and no baronet with a head seven hundred years thick, may. A man who joined his regiment at twenty and within a week challenged the most imperious and presumptuous coxcomb of a commanding officer that ever drew the breath of life through a tight waist and got broke for it is not the man to be walked over by all the Sir Lucifers, dead or alive locked or unlocked. Ha, ha, ha. Nor the man to allow his junior to be walked over either, said my guardian. Most assuredly not, said Mr. Boythorn, clapping him on the shoulder with an air of protection that had something serious in it, though he laughed. He will stand by the low boy, always. Yarndus, you may rely upon him. But speaking of this trespass with apologies to Miss Clare and Miss Summerson for the length at which I have pursued so dry a subject is there nothing for me from your men Kenge and Carboy? I think not, Esther, said Mr. Yarndus. Nothing, Guardian. Much obliged, said Mr. Boythorn. Had no need to ask, after even my slight experience of Miss Summerson's forethought for every one about her. They all encouraged me, they were determined to do it. I inquired because, coming from Lincolnshire, I of course have not yet been in town, and I thought some letters might have been sent down here. I dare say they will report progress tomorrow morning. I saw him so often in the course of the evening, which passed very pleasantly, contemplate Richard and Ada with an interest and a satisfaction that made his fine face remarkably agreeable as he sat at a little distance from the piano listening to the music and he had small occasion to tell us that he was passionately fond of music, for his face showed it that I asked my guardian as we sat at the backgammon board whether Mr. Boythorn had ever been married. No, said he. No but he meant to be, said I. How did you find out that? he returned with a smile. Why, guardian, I explained, not without reddening a little at hazarding what was in my thoughts, there is something so tender in his manner, after all, and he is so very courtly and gentle to us, and... Dash Mr. Yarndus directed his eyes to where he was sitting as I have just described him. I said no more. You are right, little woman, he answered. He was all but married once. Long ago. And once. Did the lady die? No but she died to him. That time has had its influence on all his later life. Would you suppose him to have a head and a heart full of romance yet? I think, guardian, I might have supposed so. But it is easy to say that when you have told me so. He has never since been what he might have been said Mr. Yarndus, and now you see him in his age with no one near him but his servant and his little yellow friend. It's your throw, my dear. I felt, from my guardian's manner, that beyond this point I could not pursue the subject without changing the wind. I therefore forbore to ask any further questions. I was interested, but not curious. I thought a little while about this old love story in the night when I was awakened by Mr. Boythorn's lusty snoring, and I tried to do that very difficult thing, imagine old people young again and invested with the graces of youth. 
but I fell asleep before I had succeeded, and dreamed of the days when I lived in my godmother's house. I am not sufficiently acquainted with such subjects to know whether it is at all remarkable that I almost always dreamed of that period of my life. With the morning there came a letter from Messrs. Kench and Carboy to Mr. Boythorn informing him that one of their clerks would wait upon him at noon. As it was the day of the week on which I paid the bills, and added up my books, and made all the household affairs as compact as possible, I remained at home while Mr. Yarndis, Ada and Richard took advantage of a very fine day to make a little excursion, Mr. Boythorn was to wait for Kench and Carboy's clerk and then was to go on foot to meet them on their return. Well. I was full of business, examining tradesmen's books, adding up columns, paying money, filing receipts, and I dare say making a great bustle about it when Mr. Guppy was announced and shown in. I had had some idea that the clerk who was to be sent down might be the young gentleman who had met me at the coach office, and I was glad to see him, because he was associated with my present happiness. I scarcely knew him again, he was so uncommonly smart. He had an entirely new suit of glossy clothes on, a shining hat, lilac kid gloves, a neckerchief of a variety of colors, a large hothouse flower in his buttonhole and a thick gold ring on his little finger. Besides which, he quite scented the dining room with bear's grease and other perfumery. He looked at me with an attention that quite confused me when I begged him to take a seat until the servant should return, and as he sat there crossing and uncrossing his legs in a corner, and I asked him if he had had a pleasant ride, and hoped that Mr. Kenj was well, I never looked at him but I found him looking at me in the same scrutinizing and curious way. When the request was brought to him that he would go upstairs to Mr. Boythorn's room, I mentioned that he would find lunch prepared for him when he came down, of which Mr. Yarndis hoped he would partake. He said with some embarrassment, holding the handle of the door, Shall I have the honor of finding you here, miss? I replied yes, I should be there and he went out with a bow and another look. I thought him only awkward and shy, for he was evidently much embarrassed, and I fancied that the best thing I could do would be to wait until I saw that he had everything he wanted and then to leave him to himself. The lunch was soon brought, but it remained for some time on the table. The interview with Mr. Boythorn was a long one, and a stormy one too, I should think for although his room was at some distance I heard his loud voice rising every now and then like a high wind, and evidently blowing perfect broadsides of denunciation. At last Mr. Guppy came back, looking something the worse for the conference. My eye, miss, he said in a low voice, he's a tartar. Pray take some refreshment, sir, said I. Mr. Guppy sat down at the table and began nervously sharpening the carving knife on the carving fork, still looking at me, as I felt quite sure without looking at him, in the same unusual manner. The sharpening lasted so long that at last I felt a kind of obligation on me to raise my eyes in order that I might break the spell under which he seemed to labor, of not being able to leave off. He immediately looked at the dish and began to carve. What will you take yourself, miss? You'll take a morsel of something. No, thank you, said I. Shan't I give you a piece of anything at all, miss, said Mr. Guppy, hurriedly drinking off a glass of wine. Nothing, thank you, said I. I have only waited to see that you have everything you want. Is there anything I can order for you? No. I am much obliged to you, miss, I'm sure. I've everything that I can require to make me comfortable at least I not comfortable I'm never that. He drank off two more glasses of wine, one after another. I thought I had better go. I beg your pardon, miss, said Mr. Guppy, rising when he saw me rise. But would you allow me the favor of a minute's private conversation? Not knowing what to say, I sat down again. What follows is without prejudice, miss, said Mr. Guppy, anxiously bringing a chair towards my table. 
I don't understand what you mean, said I, wondering. It's one of our law terms, miss. You won't make any use of it to my detriment at Kenj and Carboys or elsewhere. If our conversation shouldn't lead to anything, I am to be as I was and am not to be prejudiced in my situation or worldly prospects. In short, it's in total confidence. I am at a loss, sir, said I, to imagine what you can have to communicate in total confidence to me, whom you have never seen but once, but I should be very sorry to do you any injury. Thank you, miss. I'm sure of it that's quite sufficient. All this time Mr. Guppy was either planing his forehead with his handkerchief or tightly rubbing the palm of his left hand with the palm of his right. If you would excuse my taking another glass of wine, miss, I think it might assist me in getting on without a continual choke that cannot fail to be mutually unpleasant. He did so, and came back again. I took the opportunity of moving well behind my table. You wouldn't allow me to offer you one. Would you miss? said Mr. Guppy, apparently refreshed. Not any, said I. Not half a glass, said Mr. Guppy. Quarter. No. Then, to proceed. My present salary, Miss Summerson, at Kenge and Carboys, is two pound a week. When I first had the happiness of looking upon you, it was one fifteen and had stood at that figure for a lengthened period. A rise of five has since taken place, and a further rise of five is guaranteed at the expiration of a term not exceeding twelve months from the present date. My mother has a little property, which takes the form of a small life annuity, upon which she lives in an independent though unassuming manner in the old street road. She is eminently calculated for a mother-in-law. She never interferes, is all for peace, and her disposition easy. She has her failings as who has not, dash but I never knew her do it when company was present, at which time you may freely trust her with wines, spirits, or malt liquors. My own abode is lodgings at Penton Place, Pentonville. It is lowly, but airy, open at the back, and considered one of the healthiest outlets. Miss Summerson in the mildest language, I adore you. Would you be so kind as to allow me, as I may say, to file a declaration to make an offer? Mr. Guppy went down on his knees. I was well behind my table and not much frightened. I said, get up from that ridiculous position immediately, sir, or you will oblige me to break my implied promise and ring the bell. Hear me out, miss said Mr. Guppy, folding his hands. I cannot consent to hear another word, sir, I returned, unless you get up from the carpet directly and go and sit down at the table as you ought to do if you have any sense at all. He looked piteously, but slowly rose and did so. Yet what a mockery it is, miss, he said with his hand upon his heart and shaking his head at me in a melancholy manner over the tray to be stationed behind food at such a moment. The soul recoils from food at such a moment, miss. I beg you to conclude, said I, you have asked me to hear you out, and I beg you to conclude. I will, miss, said Mr. Guppy. As I love and honor, so likewise I obey. Would that I could make thee the subject of that vow before the shrine. That is quite impossible said I, and entirely out of the question. I am aware, said Mr. Guppy, leaning forward over the tray and regarding me, as I again strangely felt, though my eyes were not directed to him, with his late intent look, I am aware that in a worldly point of view, according to all appearances, my offer is a poor one. But, Miss Summerson. Angel. No. Don't ring I have been brought up in a sharp school and am accustomed to a variety of general practice. Though a young man, I have ferreted out evidence, got up cases, and seen lots of life. Blessed with your hand, what means might I not find of advancing your interests and pushing your fortunes? 
What might I not get to know, nearly concerning you? I know nothing now, certainly, but what might I not if I had your confidence, and you set me on? I told him that he addressed my interest or what he supposed to be my interest quite as unsuccessfully as he addressed my inclination, and he would now understand that I requested him, if he pleased, to go away immediately. Cruel miss, said Mr. Guppy, here but another word. I think you must have seen that I was struck with those charms on the day when I waited at the Whiter Cellar. I think you must have remarked that I could not forbear a tribute to those charms when I put up the steps of the Ucni coach. It was a feeble tribute to thee, but it was well meant. Thy image has ever since been fixed in my breast. I have walked up and down of an evening opposite Jellyby's house only to look upon the bricks that once contained thee. This out of today, quite an unnecessary out so far as the attendance, which was its pretended object, went was planned by me alone for the alone. If I speak of interest, it is only to recommend myself and my respectful wretchedness. Love was before it, and is before it. I should be pained, Mr. Guppy, said I, rising and putting my hand upon the bell rope, to do you or anyone who was sincere the injustice of slighting any honest feeling, however disagreeably expressed. If you have really meant to give me a proof of your good opinion, though ill-timed and misplaced, I feel that I ought to thank you. I have very little reason to be proud, and I am not proud. I hope, I think I added, without very well knowing what I said, that you will now go away as if you had never been so exceedingly foolish and attend to Messrs. Kenj and Carboy's business. Half a minute, miss, cried Mr. Guppy checking me as I was about to ring. This has been without prejudice. I will never mention it, said I, unless you should give me future occasion to do so. A quarter of a minute, miss. In case you should think better at any time, however distant that's no consequence, for my feelings can never alter of anything I have said, particularly what might I not do, Mr. William Guppy, 87. Penton Place, or if removed, or dead, of blighted hopes or anything of that sort, care of M.R.S. Guppy, 302, Old Street Road, will be sufficient. I rang the bell, the servant came, and Mr. Guppy, laying his written card upon the table and making a dejected bow, departed. Raising my eyes as he went out, I once more saw him looking at me after he had passed the door. I sat there for another hour or more, finishing my books and payments and getting through plenty of business. Then I arranged my desk, and put everything away, and was so composed and cheerful that I thought I had quite dismissed this unexpected incident. But, when I went upstairs to my own room, I surprised myself by beginning to laugh about it and then surprised myself still more by beginning to cry about it. In short, I was in a flutter for a little while and felt as if an old cord had been more coarsely touched than it ever had been since the days of the dear old doll, long buried in the garden. Chapter X The lowrider on the eastern borders of Chancery Lane, that is to say, more particularly in Cook's Court, Kurziter Street, Mr. Snagsby, law stationer, pursues his lawful calling. In the shade of Cook's Court, at most times a shady place, Mr. Snagsby has dealt in all sorts of blank forms of legal process, in skins and rolls of parchment, in paper fool's cap, brief, draft, brown, white, whitey brown, and blotting, in stamps, in office quills, pens, ink, india rubber, pounds, pins, pencils, sealing wax, and wafers in red tape and green ferret, in pocket books, almanacs, diaries, and law lists, in string boxes, rulers, inkstands glass and leaden pen knives, scissors, bodkins, and other small office cutlery, in short, in articles too numerous to mention, ever since he was out of his time and went into partnership with Peffer. On that occasion, 
Cook's court was in a manner revolutionized by the new inscription in fresh paint, pepper, and snags by, displacing the time-honored and not easily to be deciphered legend pepper only. For smoke, which is the London ivy, had so wreathed itself round Peffer's name and clung to his dwelling place that the affectionate parasite quite overpowered the parent tree. Peffer is never seen in Cook's court now. He is not expected there, for he has been recumbent this quarter of a century in the churchyard of St. Andrews, Holborn, with the wagons and hackney coaches roaring past him all the day and half the night like one great dragon. If he ever steal forth when the dragon is at rest to air himself again in Cook's court until admonished to return by the crowing of the sanguine cock in the cellar at the little dairy in Kurziter Street, whose ideas of daylight it would be curious to ascertain, since he knows from his personal observation next to nothing about it if Peffer ever do revisit the pale glimpses of Cook's court, which no law stationer in the trade can positively deny, he comes invisibly, and no one is the worse or wiser. In his lifetime, and likewise in the period of Snags by's time of seven long years, there dwelt with Peffer in the same law stationering premises a niece a short, shrewd niece, something too violently compressed about the waist, and with a sharp nose like a sharp autumn evening, inclining to be frosty towards the end. The cook's courtiers had a rumor flying among them that the mother of this niece did, in her daughter's childhood, moved by too jealous a solicitude that her figure should approach perfection, lace her up every morning with her maternal foot against the bedpost for a stronger hold and purchase, and further, that she exhibited internally pints of vinegar and lemon juice, which acids, they held, had mounted to the nose and temper of the patient. With whichsoever of the many tongues of rumor this frothy report originated, it either never reached or never influenced the ears of young snags by, who, having wooed and won its fair subject on his arrival at man's estate, entered into two partnerships at once. So now, in Cook's Court, Kurziter Street, Mr. Snagsby and the niece are one, and the niece still cherishes her figure, which, however tastes may differ, is unquestionably so far precious that there is mighty little of it. Mr. and Mrs. Snagsby are not only one bone and one flesh, but, to the neighbor's thinking, one voice too. That voice, appearing to proceed from MRS Snagsby alone, is heard in Cook's court very often. Mr Snagsby, otherwise than as he finds expression through these dulcet tones, is rarely heard. He is a mild, bald, timid man with a shining head and a scrubby clump of black hair sticking out at the back. He tends to meekness and obesity. As he stands at his door in Cook's Court in his grey shop coat and black calico sleeves, looking up at the clouds, or stands behind a desk in his dark shop with a heavy flat ruler, snipping and slicing at sheepskin in company with his two prentices, he is emphatically a retiring and unassuming man. From beneath his feet, at such times, as from a shrill ghost unquiet in its grave, there frequently arise complainings and lamentations in the voice already mentioned, and haply, on some occasions when these reach a sharper pitch than usual, Mr. Snagsby mentions to the prentices, I think my little woman is a giving it to Guster. This proper name, so used by Mr. Snagsby, has before now sharpened the wit of the cook's courtiers to remark that it ought to be the name of Mrs. Snagsby seeing that she might with great force and expression be termed a guster, in compliment to her stormy character. It is, however, the possession, and the only possession except fifty shillings per annum in a very small box indifferently filled with clothing, of a lean young woman from a workhouse, by some supposed to have been christened Augusta, who, although she was farmed or contracted for during her growing time by an amiable benefactor of his species resident at Tooting, and cannot fail to have been developed under the most favourable circumstances, has fits, which the parish can't account for. Guster, really aged three or four and twenty, but looking around ten years older, goes cheap with this unaccountable drawback of fits, and is so apprehensive of being returned on the hands of her patron saint that except when she is found with her head in the pail, 
or the sink, or the copper, or the dinner, or anything else that happens to be near her at the time of her seizure, she is always at work. She is a satisfaction to the parents and guardians of the prentices, who feel that there is little danger of her inspiring tender emotions in the breast of youth, she is a satisfaction to MRS Snagsby, who can always find fault with her, she is a satisfaction to Mr Snagsby, who thinks it a charity to keep her. The law stationer's establishment is, in Guster's eyes, a temple of plenty and splendor. She believes the little drawing room upstairs, always kept, as one may say, with its hair in papers and its pinafore on, to be the most elegant apartment in Christendom. The view it commands of Cook's Court at one end, not to mention a squint into Kurzeiter Street, and of Covince's the sheriff's officer's backyard at the other she regards as a prospect of unequalled beauty. The portraits it displays in oil and plenty of it too of Mr. Snagsby looking at M.R.S. Snagsby and of M.R.S. Snagsby looking at Mr. Snagsby are in her eyes as achievements of Raphael or Titian. Guster has some recompenses for her many privations. Mr. Snagsby refers everything not in the practical mysteries of the business to M.R.S. Snagsby. She manages the money, reproaches the tax gatherers, appoints the times and places of devotion on Sundays, licenses Mr. Snagsby's entertainments, and acknowledges no responsibility as to what she thinks fit to provide for dinner, in so much that she is the high standard of comparison among the neighboring wives a long way down Chancery Lane on both sides and even out in Holborn, who in any domestic passages of arms habitually call upon their husbands to look at the difference between their, the wives, position and MRS Snagsby's, and their, the husband's, behavior and Mr Snagsby's. Rumor, always flying bet like about Cook's court and scheming in and out at everybody's windows, does say that M.R.S. Snagsby is jealous and inquisitive and that Mr. Snagsby is sometimes worried out of house and home, and that if he had the spirit of a mouse he wouldn't stand it. It is even observed that the wives who quote him to their self-willed husbands as a shining example in reality look down upon him and that nobody does so with greater superciliousness than one particular lady whose lord is more than suspected of laying his umbrella on her as an instrument of correction. But these vague whisperings may arise from Mr. Snagsby's being in his way rather a meditative and poetical man, loving to walk in staple and in the summertime and to observe how countrified the sparrows and the leaves are, also to lounge about the rolls yard of a Sunday afternoon and to remark, if in good spirits, that there were old times once and that you'd find a stone coffin or two now under that chapel, he'll be bound, if you was to dig for it. He solaces his imagination, too, by thinking of the many chancellors and vices, and masters of the roles who are deceased, and he gets such a flavor of the country out of telling the two prentices how he has heard say that a brook as clear as crystal once ran right down the middle of Holborn, when turnstile really was a turnstile, leading slap away into the meadows gets such a flavor of the country out of this that he never wants to go there. The day is closing in and the gas is lighted but is not yet fully effective, for it is not quite dark. Mr. Snagsby standing at his shop door looking up at the clouds sees a crow who is out late skim westward over the slice of sky belonging to Cook's Court. The crow flies straight across Chancery Lane and Lincoln's Inn Garden into Lincoln's Inn Fields. Here, in a large house, formerly a house of state, lives Mr. Tulkinghorn. It is let off in sets of chambers now and in those shrunken fragments of its greatness, lawyers lie like maggots in nuts. But its roomy staircases, passages and antechambers still remain, and even its painted ceilings, where allegory, in Roman helmet and celestial linen, sprawls among balustrades and pillars, flowers, clouds and big-legged boys, and makes the head ache as would seem to be allegories object always, more or less. Here among his many boxes labelled with transcendent names, lives Mr. Tulkinghorn, when not speechlessly at home in country houses where the great ones of the earth are bored to death. Here he is today, quiet at his table. An oyster of the old school whom nobody can open. 
like as he is to look at, so is his apartment in the dusk of the present afternoon. Rusty, out of date, withdrawing from attention, able to afford it. Heavy, broad-backed, old-fashioned, mahogany and horsehair chairs, not easily lifted, obsolete tables with spindle legs and dusty base covers, presentation prints of the holders of great titles in the last generation or the last but one, environ him. A thick and dingy turkey carpet muffles the floor where he sits, attended by two candles in old-fashioned silver candlesticks that give a very insufficient light to his large room. The titles on the backs of his books have retired into the binding, everything that can have a lock has got one, no key is visible. Very few loose papers are about. He has some manuscript near him, but is not referring to it. With the round top of an inkstand and two broken bits of sealing wax he is silently and slowly working out whatever train of indecision is in his mind. Now the inkstand top is in the middle, now the red bit of sealing wax, now the black bit. That's not it. Mr. Tulkinghorn must gather them all up and begin again. Here, beneath the painted ceiling, with foreshortened allegory staring down at his intrusion as if it meant to swoop upon him, and he cutting it dead, Mr. Tulkinghorn has at once his house and office. He keeps no staff, only one middle-aged man, usually a little out at elbows, who sits in a high pew in the hall and is rarely overburdened with business. Mr. Tulkinghorn is not in a common way. He wants no clerks. He is a great reservoir of confidences, not to be so tapped. His clients want him, he is all in all. Drafts that he requires to be drawn are drawn by special pleaders in the temple on mysterious instructions, fair copies that he requires to be made are made at the stationers, expense being no consideration. The middle-aged man in the pew knows scarcely more of the affairs of the peerage than any crossing sweeper in Holborn. The red bit, the black bit, the inkstand top, the other inkstand top, the little sandbox. So. You to the middle, you to the right, you to the left. This train of indecision must surely be worked out now or never. Now. Mr. Tulkinghorn gets up, adjusts his spectacles, puts on his hat, puts the manuscript in his pocket, goes out. Tells the middle aged man out at elbows, I shall be back presently. Very rarely tells him anything more explicit. Mr. Tulkinghorn goes, as the crow came not quite so straight, but nearly to Cook's Court, Kurziter Street. To Snagsby's, law stationers, deeds engrossed and copied, law writing executed in all its branches, and see, and see, and see. It is somewhere about five or six o'clock in the afternoon, and a balmy fragrance of warm tea hovers in Cook's Court. It hovers about Snagsby's door. The hours are early there. Dinner at half past one and supper at half past nine. Mr. Snagsby was about to descend into the subterranean regions to take tea when he looked out of his door just now and saw the crow who was out late. Master at home. Guster is minding the shop for the apprentices take tea in the kitchen with M.R. and M.R.S. snags by, consequently, the robbermaker's two daughters, combing their curls at the two glasses in the two second-floor windows of the opposite house, are not driving the two apprentices to distraction as they fondly suppose, but are merely awakening the unprofitable admiration of Guster, whose hair won't grow, and never would, and it is confidently thought, never will. Master at home, says Mr. Tulkinghorn. Master is at home, and Guster will fetch him. Guster disappears, glad to get out of the shop, which she regards with mingled dread and veneration as a storehouse of awful implements of the great torture of the law a place not to be entered after the gas is turned off. Mr. Snagsby appears, greasy, warm, herbaceous, and chewing. Bolts a bit of bread and butter. Says, Bless my soul, sir. Mr. Tulkinghorn. I want half a word with you, snags by. Certainly, sir. 
Dear me, sir, why didn't you send your young man round for me? Pray walk into the back shop, sir. Snagsby has brightened in a moment. The confined room, strong of parchment grease, is warehouse, counting house, and copying office. Mr. Tulkinghorn sits, facing round, on a stool at the desk. Yarndus and Yarndus, Snagsby. Yes, sir. Mr. Snagsby turns up the gas and coughs behind his hand, modestly anticipating profit. Mr. Snagsby, as a timid man, is accustomed to cough with a variety of expressions, and so to save words. Audiobook generated by Read with the ears.